Good morning. Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church. Um, I've got my readers on because my new glasses aren't here yet, so everybody looks blurry. So I hope everybody's smiling. Um, and, and for our Facebook family, thank you for joining us this morning. I, I have something to say directly to the Facebook family. We just got through singing The Old Rugged Cross, one of the greatest songs I think that's ever been written. And um, there's something that you folks are missing, and we wish you guys could come join us in the sanctuary because there's nothing like singing that song and hearing people's voices and the emotion that goes into it. Um, it's just something that, that you just can't get from watching on. I'm glad that we have the ability to share the way we can with the, with the Facebook, but uh, there's something about being in the presence uh, of God's house, with God's people, and God's presence. So I just want to encourage you guys to come join us. Um, before we uh, before we do the announcements and before we do our prayer requests, I think uh, we we might have at least one birthday that needs to be recognized this morning. So maybe we can do that right now. I think I can get a little crown on my next birthday. I love that. That was perfect. Yeah. I could wear pink I, if I have to. I can do that. All right. Uh, what about anniversaries? Anybody had an anniversary we want to recognize? None? All right. Well, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of uh, quick announcements, and then we'll do a uh, prayer request. Uh, tomorrow is uh, President's Day, and apparently on the back table we've got a bunch of President presidential facts in a bulletin so if you want to pick something up and look about uh, presidential facts we've got that available for you um, it looks like the title is games and grub uh, tonight at six o'clock we're having kind of a, a social out in the joy center i guess and and i think don you might be the person that can give us some more information about that if that, that's correct Hang out. And and hang out and why not have a little booth too? We used to do this a long, long time ago, and, and when Lisa and Stanley Wilharbor would get together, you had to watch out because it's two really competitive people. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, if you're super ultra competitive, you might leave that at the door. This is going to be about fun, not uh, getting mad and calling names or something. So. <laughs> All right. Um, no, yeah, our Sunday school lesson today was bitterness, and we're not going to have any of that after having a social at church. <laughs> um, any, other, any other announcements we've got? All right. If not, we'll go to our prayer list. We've got a kind of a long list here as usual, but I uh, want to lift everybody up. We've got Hudson Pace, um, and I understand that Hudson, just to, to single him out just for a minute, he, he gets to go back or he got to go back one day. Last week, so he got to go back one day in school and really excited about being able to do that. So uh, let's keep praying that that can bump up for two days and, and on and on. Um, Emily Dulworth, uh, Landon Craig, uh, Austin Higgins. Uh, he's going to be deployed to the Ukraine. So uh, there's a few, few of our 81st Airborne, I believe. Um, uh, Tana Williams. Uh, Reba Ingram, George Walls, Jack Rudy, Bill and Janet Miller, uh, Ruth Lee Powell, Marcy Leonard, David Boren family, Stan, uh, excuse me, Stan Blankenship, Donnie Porter, Mary McCaig, Ron Stevens, uh, Bruce Hargrove, Leah Edison, Bailey Parker, uh, Jimmy Compton, Tornado Victims, uh, Mike Soper, Amanda Webb, Sandra, Sandra Allison, 
Ginger Thomas, Dawson Young, um, Abby Shuey, Erica Black, uh, Amanda Lear, Nancy Nyblack, <coughs> Jodon Curtis, <coughs> Ann Steele, Joan Steele, Ann Dameron, Life Care Residents and their staff, uh, Nancy Stewart, Marty Brown, Paul Rudolph, our law enforcement officers and their first responders, uh, Debbie Stewart, Donna Steele, Alyssa Binkley, <coughs> Sandy Moss, Peggy Sheffer, Tommy Myers, um, our country and the leaders and the decisions that we're making uh, that are going to affect us in a big way in, in the next uh, few weeks as it relates to potential with war, and then also our unspoken uh, prayer requests. Is there anybody we want to add to the prayer list at this time? All right, I would encourage you guys to pick up one of these lists. There's, a, there's always good information and more detail about some of the, the issues that these folks are facing and how we might be able to help and at least how we can tailor our prayer. So uh, without any further ado, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for the beautiful day that you've given us this morning, for the fact that we've got so many people here to join us in the sanctuary and those that are joining us on Facebook. Lord, we, we pray that everybody is here for a reason. They're here to express their love and compassion uh, for you and, and for what you mean to us, Father, and that we can maybe learn for whatever you put on Brother Robert's heart, how we can take that love and compassion and manifest it into an action. Lord, whether it's taking this prayer list and praying over the people that are on it, asking for, for guidance for how uh, the doctors can help them and how we can come alongside them, Lord. I just thank you for the ability that we have to do that. And Father, we just pray that as we go through this week, reveal to us, Lord, how we can be those hands and feet, how we can be something good that we can uh, share love and compassion if that's what these, uh, an, an individual needs. Open our hearts and our eyes to the path that you would lead us in this week. And it's in your son's heaven and we pray these things. Amen. Lane, don't you take his toys anymore. I, saw, I heard that. 315. Take your hand on turn to number 315. Let's stand and sing it through one time. His name is wonderful. Forty-seven. <clears throat> Number four forty-seven. Let's sing all four verses. Man, thank you for participating in worship. It's always a blessing to hear individuals singing about the Lord, and what He can do in their lives, our lives, from individuals that have experienced it. Isaiah fifty-nine. If you have your Bibles, Isaiah fifty-nine. What can Christians do that non-Christians cannot do? Need to realize the benefits of being a Christian. 
And at the same time, the power that lies within us to overcome our sins in our life that God has given us or that Jesus has given us through salvation. A sinner may desire, a non-Christian may desire to uh, turn over a new leaf and stop sinning a certain sins, but in circum cer certain circumstances, they're unable to do that. But you can as a Christian. I want to begin with the idea of sin and looking at Israel. And whatever, when, here in Isaiah, uh, when God accuses Israel of something, this is, this is universal throughout all history. How God dealt with Israel, moral and ethically, He deals with every nation. And He has throughout the years, as far as the Scriptures and even in the New Testament, when we see historically past the New Testament. Uh, I, I've been studying in Isaiah this week. I, I lack seven, ver seven chapters of completing an outline, complete outline, verse by verse, going through the 66 chapters of Isaiah and uh, looking at it every verse. And I lack uh, seven from 33 to 39. And when you look at Isaiah, he, he was probably, well, I, I don't know of any other... Uh, living a prophet that lived longer than what he did. He is attributed to living five, through five kings, their reign. And these are not four or eight year reigns. These are long term reigns. And he lived that long. Uh, chapter 1 through chapter 39, we see an accusation or prophecies about Israel and what uh, they needed to do for the Lord. And uh, uh, Isaiah told them they're going into captivity. That was the first 39 chapters of Isaiah. From 40 to 59, we see the idea of restoration of Israel. Good news, you're coming back. And then from 60 to 66, we see what it's going to be like in the last days or when the kingdom is finally established and Israel becomes a full nation in the millennium uh, rule and reign after Jesus takes over and rules in the nations. The, the Isaiah is, is strong on the blessings of the Lord and what he, what he can give you. He accused here in chapter 59, he's telling them, you did not claim what God told you in 58. 58, it was about worship and what God would do for Israel if they worshiped Him. And 59 is accusation, why did you not do what God told you to do? And he discussing that. And as we go through this, we'll look a little bit about the nation of Israel. But in the end, I want to challenge each and every one of us to the idea, there's whatever sin is in our life, begin to diminish it just a little bit. That's the power that you have. Sins that may be troubling you or more so troubling other people, you can, as a Christian, diminish that, deflate it, or even delete it out of your life because you have the power of God within you. And we see that's what, that's what Isaiah was trying to tell the nation of Israel. When you worship the Lord and you're close to Him, He gives you the power to overcome uh, sin and devil and all of the tribulation. You can be victorious soldiers in Christ's army. He encourages them that way. Look in verse 1, starting in verse 1 of chapter 59. It says, Indeed, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save. And his ear is not too deaf to hear, but your iniquities are separating you from your God, and your sins are hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear, for your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongues muttered injustice. No one makes claims justly, no one pleads honestly. They trust in empty and worthless words. They conceive trouble and give birth to iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave spiders' webs. 
Whoever eats their eggs will die, crack one open, and a viper is hatched. Their webs cannot become clothing, and they cannot cover themselves with their words. Their works are sinful works, the, and violent acts are in their hands. Their feet run after evil, and they rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are sinful thoughts. Ruin and wretchedness are in their path. They have not known the path of peace, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made their roads crooked, and no one who walks in them will know peace. You know, here, here's the idea that he's encouraging them. This is the reason the blessings are not flowing in chapter 58 in your life. I was reading after some rabbis this week, and they said that uh, in Genesis, the second day, when God created, when God created the second day, He created hell then. And I was interested, and I studied a little bit on it. That's in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. That's the only day that God did not offer a blessing. He did not say it was a good day on the second day. And the rabbis were discussing this at length. And the reason is that he created, when he created the heavens, he also created hell. May have been a, a war then. That may have been when it happened. Who knows when the angels rebelled and uh, rebelled against God. But he created hell according to them in the, on the second day because it was not a good day. We've had days that were not good days in our life as well. Seeking the blessings of the Lord, seeking Him in our lives. I found out if, it, if a Christian has a purpose, if they know that they're serving the Lord, and they know what they're doing is in service to the Lord, you, you, can, you, you can be doing whatever a non-Christian is doing, but yet you can do it for the Lord, and God counts that as righteousness in the same way that he counted righteousness for Abraham. And many of the other individuals in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when you believe God and you're saying, Lord, I, I, I'm committing my life to you and I'm doing these things because I love you. And we'll get into the idea of what you can do as a Christian, what you can do as a, as a person in order to claim some of those blessings in his life. But here the Isaiah is speaking to Israel about the moral and the uh, uh, spiritual decline of the nation. And he makes that call to them. It's the moral and ethical nation that is demised. That's the reason you can't have the blessings that you have. There are certain blessings that God gives a nation. Certain blessings economically that he might bless a whole nation with. Whereas uh, where, uh, without his blessings, it might not uh, fare very well. And that's what happened to Israel. We, I, heard, I was listening to a tape from a, a Messianic Jew this week, and one of the prophecies is it, uh, in the last days is that Israel would flourish and have plenty of water and, and vegetation. And he was a Messianic Jew from Jew from Jerusalem, and he said, I'm looking forward to that day. Why? Because it's nothing but a desert now. There's not, they have to haul in water. They have to do a lot of things to grow anything uh, in Israel. And he said, I I'm looking forward to that day where it will be a good day for Israel to prosper in that way. And Isaiah is saying, this is what you need to do in your life. The prophet denies right off the bat the idea that Jehovah could not save them from the political and personal problems that they were having. We might doubt him sometime as well. Here in verse 1 it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save deliver, that God cannot be victorious, that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear what you're saying. He, he starts off in saying, God is hearing you. God is listening to you and your problems. And he shows them their deeds and their decisions that have separated them from being able, from God being able to hear their prayers and their petitions. 
But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The idea of a Christian, though, one thing that we can do that Israel failed to do is repent and confess and move past what that sin and that iniquity does to our life. That's a glorious thing about being a Christian, repentance, forgiveness, seeking the face of God, feeling like as David often, Lord, what is wrong? I feel like there's something wrong. Help me with this and being able to be restored or finding an answer from the Lord. Israel did not even seek that avenue or that privilege as a nation. Having explained Isaiah, having explained their deeds and attitudes that was separating them from the fellowship of God, he says he talks about the the idea of snakes and uh, you're, you're fooling with snakes and hatching. People are lying to you. You think it's going to be good for you as a nation, and they lied to you, and it's not. And he encourages them not to listen to that. You need to repent and turn toward me in that. Listen to the individuals that are speaking justice and judgment. But he adds a list of the most, I guess, offensive sins to him. Run to evil, they shed innocent blood, they, they had thoughts of iniquity, they were wasting and destroying many of the old paths and traditions that God had set down. There was no judgment or justice and they didn't have any peace in their lives, something that we seek in our lives as well. We desire certain things from our government. We desire certain things from our God. And one of the things that they were not doing is not giving the peace that the people needed in their life. God challenges them to show him how their way is better than his way. Show me how your life is better than what I was going to provide for you. Show me how these blessings that you've decided to do and be blessed by is better than what I've got giving you. And that's something that a Christian can do. The closer we live to the Lord, the more he blesses. The closer we do in our life what His will is, the closer fellowship we have in walking with Him. He, in verse 14 and 15, talks about judgment and justice and honesty and truth. And many of these things Israel were not doing in their courts or among the merchants. They were cheating one another in that way. The idea in this passage is that the Messiah is coming and he will do all of these things for you. But see, they didn't really believe it. They've been in captivity for so long. They've had so many problems. The, the government was so strong. They're captives. There's no way anybody can uh, overthrow this government. And God says, don't underestimate my arm. I can save. We may be burdened down with problems and difficulties that we might say the same thing. How can God help me? How, how can God fix this? What, what, what can he do? It, it, we feel like we're just praying and it's just a ritual more than it is a reality. But it is a reality. That's what Isaiah was saying. This is real. God is real. God hears your problems. Don't diminish your idea of what he, how he thinks of you in your life. You know, when did you realize that you were a sinner? Isaiah was trying to encourage them in that way. He describes a resume for the deliverer. This is what this man is going to do in verse 14 and 15. He will bring judgment. He will bring justice. He will bring truth. How many times have you heard on the news where people were dissatisfied with the, I guess, the, uh, the answer that the judge or the jury came up with? The conclusion... I mean, the individuals rioted and, and were upset by that decision that the courts had made. 
The Bible says here, or he is telling Israel, uh, that you don't have to worry about this man. When he makes a decision, it will please all of you. He is going to make the right decision. In verse 16, and he said, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. Here we see the prophecy about the damage and the decay that this was bringing to the nation. And nations will uh, fall when they do, when you find out their moral and ethical belief. When they turn to liberalism, when they turn to the idea of that they know more than what the Bible knows. Yes, the Bible's old. It has old traditions and old ideas. But God says, I will honor them and I will bless them, but I will not bless a nation that deviates from what I desire it should be. The idea of the Messiah, the idea of uh, lying and selfishness and going to do away with all of those things, especially during the millennial reign, he will reign. But you know, Israel, or God, uh, looked everywhere. This man is going to be a man of integrity. And he looked uh, in the present for any individual in Israel that could uh, be empowered. I will empower a man. I will bring a man and give them all the power that they need in order to bring this nation to a, be a godly nation. But he couldn't find any. None, because they would turn to selfishness. When they were given that much power, they would sin with all that power. And we see that in politics today, do we not? So he looks into the future. God looks into the future and he says, let's see if I can see anybody that will ever be born that I can use as a deliverer to save Israel from the moral and from the sinful decay of this nation. He found no one. So what does the Bible say he did? He had to send his son. See, that's the reason Jesus came is because he could find no one to deliver the nation or the world out of their sin. He could find no one that stood for justice and righteousness and peace and be able to rule a nation in heaven and everybody be satisfied with the decisions that he was about to make. It speaks of a person establishing these things. And isn't it the type that you like? Don't you want judgment, the right judgment, the right justice? Don't you want individuals to look honestly at you and not be swayed by money or politics or any of the evil things that we see today? Look at me and judge me accordingly is what Israel wanted But you know, how can just one person, how how can you make a difference in a world like that? You you know, he looked and there was no one to deliver that. And that's true. You you cannot be a deliverer or somebody that saves a nation from their sins or from their morals and ethics. You might not be able to save the nation. But what can you do as a person? And Isaiah was addressing that singularly. He addressed himself in one, one place here. He uses personal pronouns, us, me, we. He, he changed it from you to us because he saw his sin. He saw his shortcoming and his failure because as, a, uh, as an individual that must, de- must be de- te- depending on a Savior, he was in the same boat with everybody else. God looked at Isaiah and said, Isaiah, you're not that man. You're not the deliverer. You're not the Messiah. He's going to have to come later. But looking at individuals in the Bible, they did make a difference in their family, in their friends, in their neighborhood, and maybe to certain offices that they may have held in that time, in that day. Take Enoch, for instance. He made a difference by pleasing God. What can you do in your life in order to maybe uh, diminish or deflate some sins in your life and highlight other things that Christians can do? Non-Christians cannot do these things. They cannot please God. Enoch pleased God. 
Non-Christians cannot do that. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Well, that's a little vague, isn't it? That's like explaining, uh, saying something and you want the rest of the story, don't you? What, well, what did he do? How did he walk with him? What did he, you know, you had a lot of questions when you read it in Genesis. Hebrews gives a little bit better idea. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Faith. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, somehow in his life, it was very evident that he was pleasing God. Now, what that evidence was, what they could see in him that he pleased God, it doesn't say. But the idea is that one individual, Enoch was a normal person, one individual can set out to try and please God. God, and see what blessings pursue of that. You might not be able to walk right into heaven. I, who knows what kind of blessings that the Lord has store for one individual that will say, I want to please God and proceed to study the Bible and do the things that God says is pleasing to him. Another one is Noah. Made a difference by fearing God. That caused him to do God's will. Now, the scripture says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Now, he feared God. He feared his words. He believed that God's word about destroying the world was going to come to pass. Now, he didn't build a little rowboat. He thought, God, that's a little bit extensive there. You know how many years it's going to take me to build that ark? I, I mean, really, that's going to take a... Cannot just build a uh, hew out, maybe a log, and get my family in that, a couple of logs tied together, and we can... No, this is not what I want. He feared God that it was going to happen. And it says that he prepared the ark, is what he said. Now, God may not be calling you to prepare an ark, but... Yet we can have the fear of the Lord, and out of the fear of the Lord, we can hear the messages of the Lord. We can have faith in His messages and fear what God says is true, and out of that fear, we're moved to do His will. One person can do that because one person has done it in the past. Abraham is another one that made a difference by being careful to live a spiritual life. Abraham, we know the title or we know the I guess a reputation that Abraham has even in the Old Testament Genesis 17 says and when Abram was 90 years old and nine the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him I am the almighty God walk before me and be thou perfect now uh, if you don't understand the word perfect be mature be spiritually mature that's something that one in, a Christian can do, is to seek spiritual maturity. Not, not continue as a child that is uneducated and unlearned and doesn't have the experience of fighting off uh, evil in the world of their world, but yet out of what Abraham did was he wanted to be mature. And when God told him something, out of maturity he acted. He didn't act like a child and wallow on the floor and scream and rebel. The Bible says that he did that. We have another one in a negative sense. We see Solomon. He didn't make a difference because he allowed the wrong people and the wrong message to touch his heart. Now you would have thought Solomon, with all his wisdom, with all his experience, with writing the scriptures and the Song of Solomon and the Proverbs that he wrote, that he would have been a little bit more intelligent than what he was at the end. A warning to us that it might happen to us as well. A caution goes out from the Lord about Solomon. First Kings 11, For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect or mature spiritually with the Lord his God, as was his heart, as was the heart of David his father. 
Any of these individuals, one individual could make a difference, maybe not as a deliverer, maybe not as a Messiah, but do you know these individuals caught the eye of God? And out of that, the blessings pursued from that, because God's the one that can bless beyond and above what we can ask or think, the Scripture says. One person can do some of these things. And out of doing that, not only are you blessed, but your family and individuals, friends, and maybe even your community. Many women in the Bible made a difference. Naomi, who lived, with, uh, with, uh, lived her life before Ruth, the daughter-in-law, the Moabitess, we know the story about what happened to her and how Ruth stayed with Naomi. Naomi lived a godly life before the family, enough to impress the daughter-in-law to stay with her. Wow, if God can do that, and if you can, if you can act and, and live like you live and all that's happened to you and still worship the Lord, I want to worship Him also. He must be something great and grand. Queen Esther gave advice that saved the nation when you read the book. The prayer warrior Anna, who served God in the temple with her fasting and prayer, made a difference in the world that she lived in as well. There was a quote that I had from, uh, from uh, Lockyer, all the women of the Bible, I was reading it, and it says, If hum humanity is to be purified and Christianized to, go to a far greater extent, it is with the women who have been enlightened and spiritualized. May God increase the number of Christian women through whom he can draw a sin-cursed, war-weary earth nearer to himself. So the idea, when we even look in the New Testament, the women that were in the New Testament, Lydia, there's many other individuals. They were not messiahs, but they made a difference in their lives and in the lives of other individuals. How can we make a difference? I'm just one person. I don't know that I can make that much difference. Well, ask uh, Abraham and his family when he delivered Lot. Ask some of the other individuals about the influence that they had. Ask Noah and his family about being faithful to build the ark and saving all of his family from destruction if they made a difference in the lives of the family. Husbands can remove any hindrances to their prayer life. One hindrance is listed in 1 Peter. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So one person can treat their wife well, and out of that, their prayers are not hindered. So the flip side of that, I would think that God would hear your prayers based on uh, your wife. Wives can become living examples of the power of Jesus and transformation. Peter says, likewise, you wives, they also may, your husbands may be without the word. They may not be Christians, but they can be won by your conversation or your manner of life. The idea of the impression that individuals get by a godly woman. Christian can contribute to the benefits of church by attending church. Everybody knows Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Rick mentioned this in his announcements. As a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The benefits that you get from attending church. The spirit that is there. The fellowship. The, the individuals that might greet you. Don't run out too quickly and allow us to shake your hand and fellowship a little bit while we're with you. Here it says here, but exhorting one another. He lists the idea. We're lifting one another up in times of depress, depression or times of problems or, or, or difficulties. 
stay in, and fellowship just a little bit where we can hug you and say we love you and care. And we're glad you came and to be with us. Christians can communicate in how they talk to one another. Timothy says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. Profanity. You, you see it and you hear it everywhere. Movies, in your social media, everybody likes to use profanity along. God says, make your conversations different, that you will stand out and you're going to be different than somebody else because I will notice that and I will bless you from it. One person, yes, you're just one person, but Yet the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have something that no lost individual, that no non-Christian has. You have the strength and the promise that God will strengthen you. You say, I'm just one person, you know, I'm just one person, Lord. Yes, I know all of these other individuals were just one person, but by my power and my strength, I bless them and encourage them. I would think Noah got awful weary of hammering and pulling together and all the jeering and all the talk and all the criticism that he received of the individuals, the mocking and the laughter. I I would imagine he got a little bit discouraged too. What pushed him forward? It was the strength of the Lord and the promise, I believe you, Lord. First thing we're going to have to do is believe that the Lord loves us. Believe that the the prayers are real and not some ritual that we're just praying because we're just supposed to pray. It's a reality. He does hear your prayers when you're weeping silently, when you're crying out to Him, when you're fellowshipping and worshiping in church. When you're attending Sunday school and some word comes to you and you lift it up to the Lord, He hears you. What should I do? One person, that's all you are, is one person. But if you were not there, your family would miss you. Ask the individuals that go to funerals every day how they miss their wives and their husbands and their children that have passed from this world to the next. Yes, well, you're just one person, but you do matter not only to your family and friends, but to the Lord Jesus as well. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for the challenge that is set before us. We want to please you. And there may be other things that you desire from us, Lord. Salvation is the first step of faith that we gave you. Lord, there may be somebody here that has not made that step or decision. We pray they'll do that today. Help us. Help us with our faith when it grows and it weakens. Help us when we're down and feel defeated and depressed because life does not do what we wanted it to do. Weeping on your shoulder, Lord, give us the strength to know what to do next. Bless us when we're encouraged by one another, by exhorting one another. Thank the ones and bless the ones that came out this morning. Give them that special blessing because they are here worshiping you. Sacrifice something to be here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing what number? 423. 423.